I will start introducing the concepts of food security and insecurity. Then I will go on to crop wild relatives and how they are important to uh, uh, and help. Well, help, how will how will they help and pinning and the pin food security? Then I will start doing a very brief summary of how to develop national strategies to 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 conserve these crop wild relatives. How then we use GBF mediated data in these strategies? Some examples and finally recommendations and conclusions. So food security uh, exists when all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. And this concept has been introduced by FAO in 2009 at the World Food Summit and it has a new dimension which is a nutritional dimension that wasn't uh, in the concept before. It is, uh, the concept is supported by four uh, uh, four pillars, and that, that is availability of resources, the access, uh, physical, social, and economic access, utilization, and uh, utilization of food, uh, taking into consideration the basic uh, nutrition knowledge, um, and lastly, the stability over time of these three other pillars. Okay. Ah. So then food insecurity is when people lack secure access to sufficient amounts of safe and nutritious food for normal growth and development and an active and uh, healthy lifestyle. Food insecurity leads to malnutrition, which is a general concept that uh, means a lack of uh, some or all nutrition. It then leads to vulnerability to diseases, alternations of growth and human development, and finally to cognition impairment. So where do we stand at the moment? Uh, we, uh, it has been estimated that uh, the world population is about 7.26 billion of people, and one in eight are suffering from chronic undernourishment. In fact, undernourishment in developing countries has been decreasing over time, as you can see in the graph uh, on the right, uh, but uh, it is barely uh, meeting the goals set up by the World Food Summit, which is um, uh, here, about 500 million in 2015, and uh, by the Millennium uh, Development Goals, which is also uh, a bit lower, 450 million. So, in one year, I don't think we can reach these uh, these values. It is predicted that the population will rise uh, to 9.6 billion in uh, by 2015. And uh, some estimates by the UN have predicted, uh, have a, well, they have three uh, predictions, 16 billion by 2100, a 10 billion, which is an average uh, prediction, uh, and a more optimistic prediction for global population by 2100 of 6 billion people. And as you can see in, the, in, in this graph on the left, uh, this global population change is not uh, even in all the world. Europe is to remain more or less the same and uh, in Asia, Americas and Africa the population will definitely grow uh, by 2050. In addition to this, uh, climate change is predicted to have a negatively as well as a positively impact actually in the north of uh, the world, but a projected impact, a negative uh, projected impact on the agriculture yields. And this will be um, even uh, harder in Africa, in Australia, Asia, also in Latin, uh, South and uh, Central America. So to feed the human population to 2050, we will require we will require food supplies to increase by 60% globally and the 100% in developing countries. But agriculture productivity produ agriculture production will decrease by 3% each decade. So we really need to tackle this issue as it seems that we are not going to make it um, in the future. 
The World Resources Institute has uh, provided some solutions, uh, but basically what we need are crops that have higher yields, higher nutritional value, that are adapted to degraded lands and adapted to changing environments, and crop-wide relatives do tackle this issue. Um, these are wild plant species closely related to crops. Uh, they have an indirect use as gene donors for crop improvement because they are relatively close genet genetically to a crop. So they are an important socioeconomic resource that offer novel genetic diversity that is required to maintain food security in the, uh, in the future. A broad definition that is used um, uh, worldwide is that crop art relatives are all those taxa that fall within the same genus as a crop. So crop art relatives have been used for many years now as a source of adaptive traits and in this uh, in here you have some um, examples for barley, sweet potato, tomato, lettuce and cassava. And it has been uh, the crop art relative, uh, crop art relative's contribution uh, has been valued as uh, more than one hundred billion dollars towards crop yields per year. So they are really a valuable resource. They are accounted for twenty one percent of the world's flora. And as, as they are national, the, as they are wild plant species, they are becoming threatened. And in fact, a very recent study uh, by Sheila Kell and colleagues of t in 2012, just for Europe, we know that two out of ten crop wild relative species are threatened of extinction. So, are they conserved? If they are so important and they are threatened, are they really conserved? We have seen that ex situ conservation of these uh, wild species are, uh, is currently inadequate. These are old numbers, but I, I, I know that the trend is the same. They are not conserved ex situ uh, at the moment, or they are, some efforts are still uh, undergoing, but at the moment it's still uh, right in the beginning. And they are found in existing protected areas, uh, but not, they are not actively managed or monitored. There are a few examples of crop pod relative conservation um, in some countries. For wild uh, relatives of wheat, you have some genetic reserves in Israel. You have in Mexico for uh, a wild relative of maize. Uh, in Peru, you have um, active conservation of wild species of potato, and these are just a few examples. So, okay, why do we need national strategies to conserve these species? We know they are unique national resources, they are threatened, a legislative requirement uh, is needed to actually uh, conserve them and to eff efficiently conserve them, and it's, uh, their conservation requires an integrated in-situ and ex-situ approach which is usually best implemented by a national strategy. There is no single method of generation, but throughout the years we have developed this model, which you, I know you cannot see very clearly, but basically uh, it shows you how to uh, produce a national strategy to conserve these resources. You start with a, a flora or a, a flora checklist, you then have, on the other hand, a list of crops, and these crops can be either grown at national level or grown globally. And then you match the two of them and you extract all the species, uh, you extract your checklist of crop art relatives. So all the species, wild species that fall in, within the same genus as a, cro of a crop, it's a, a, wild a crop art relative. You then prioritize because you do need to do it, otherwise you cannot uh, conserve, conserve all of them. And then you do all your studies, genetic diversity studies, taxonomic, ecogeographic studies, um, threat assessment. And at the end, what you do need to do is a gap analysis and see what are the gaps of uh, in situ gaps and ex situ gaps. And you establish your conservation goals. 
The final product is usually a network of genetic reserves to conserve crop wild relatives, as well as a systematic ex situ conservation plan to conserve these species. So where does GBIF enters in this whole process? Countries that do not have a checklist, a flora checklist, they can, ex they can start doing, uh, doing that using a check, uh, GBIF data, just as a starting point. Prioritization of these crop wild relatives can also be uh, done with GBIF data if one of the criteria to prioritize those species is distribution, for example. Ecogeographic diversity analysis, uh, also um, genetic diversity analysis, GBIF has been used to um, select populations to then collect uh, um, leaf samples to then do this genetic diversity analysis, for threat assessment, and finally, of course, to um, establish or to suggest a network of genetic reserves and a systematic ex situ conservation plan. So how do we have been using GBIF mediated data? We download the GBIF, remove duplicate records, we check for spelling errors, we filter those records that have coordinates, and sometimes we even use only those records that have more than two or more decimal digits. We format the data, we assign a level of geographic precision for some analysis, we check for outliers, and then we add this GBIF data to the databases and do our analysis. So now I will show you just some examples on how this GBIF uh, data has been used. 32 records only from GBIF, but this was a, a couple of years ago, have been used to uh, establish complementary sites that conserve priority crop wild relatives in Portugal. GBIF data has also been used to identify hotspots of crop wild relatives in Spain and also in Norway. And uh, I should point this out, there has been a very good link with GBIF Norway in this project and uh, almost 600,000 records have been obtained through GBIF. And also a uh, complementary site to conserve priority crop wild relatives in Norway have been using this data and further analysis using molecular markers will be um, uh, carried out to determine if taxonomic diversity is correlated with genetic diversity. And now, uh, GBIF has also been used to assess the representativeness of gene bank collections of Spanish lupinos. As a, this is a, 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 a very dense slide, a slide. I will try to explain a bit more in detail. So the aim of this study was to detect underrepresented ecogeographic diversity through gap analysis in order to optimize for uh, germplasm collecting strategies. So basically what uh, Mauricio, the, the first author of this paper, did was to produce an ecogeographic land characterization map that could reflect the adaptive scenarios of Lupino species in Spain. He then superimposed um, uh, these species occurrences from which he uh, collected from GBIF onto this ELC map and he tried to he um, extracted the ecogeographic categories for each of these points. He then compared which ones were ex situ uh, accessions with the other ones that weren't ex situ and found the gaps. So the gaps were those populations that were not sampled and conserved ex situ. He then uh, select underrepresented and priority ecogeographic categories based on their frequency uh, in existing accessions. He also detected spatial gaps and uh, did some distribution, uh, predicted distribution of these species and then select, finally select the sites for further collecting based on these uh, ecogeographic and spatial gaps and in these predicted uh, distribution maps of lupinas. Uh, this is just a work uh, representing, uh, well, summarizing these, uh, these steps. The first A, sorry, A are the data collected. These are uh, buffers around data. In C, you have the ELC map, so each color represents a different ecogeographic category. And each ecogeographic category means that 
the ecogeographic variables at those sites at those sites have uh, are the same and the, these are the final uh, collecting uh, spots that uh, uh, should be targeted for uh, conservation. At the global level, um, a project funded by the Norwegian government and led by Global Crop Diversity Trust and the Millennium Seed Bank uh, tried or is trying to collect, conserve and prepare crop art relatives for uh, uh, for well to be used in uh, crop improvement in the future, facing uh, these climate change scenarios. 81 crop gene pools were selected, and more than 150,000 records from GB were used in this analysis. The gaps for ex situ uh, conservation were also identified. Then these gaps were um, sent to, nation, to individual countries who started doing this, those collections. And the seeds will be then conserved at national gene, ba gene banks, at the Millennium Seed Bank and the uh, Svalbard Seed Vault in Norway. Then these seeds will also be, used, uh, be prepared for use in breeding crops for new climates. And they will be evaluated for, for useful traits related to climate change. Some of the publications and studies have come out of this uh, proje project and the Global Priority Crop Adrality Inventory by Holly Vincent and colleagues is one of them. So Holly, she um, produced an inventory of the priority crop pod relatives of the world and this was based on the ease of use. Uh, and when I say ease of use, it's uh, ease of, um, of crossing to the crop and threat. She identified uh, almost 2,000 priority crop wild relatives from 194 crops. And uh, you cannot see very clearly, but uh, the three hotspots of crop wild relatives are Eastern Asia, uh, followed by China and um, Southeastern Europe. So where to conserve this priority uh, crop wild relative diversity? A species map, richness map was also developed and created. It's very small, but one of the, the areas, the rich, one of the areas that is rich in terms of priority crop wild relatives is the Middle East. And uh, a hotspots, hotspot for ex situ collecting was also um, produced uh, by Nora. Um, which showed us where we have to target our collections soon. So we have Turkey, Greece, Italy, Portugal and Spain and these are hotspots for ex situ collecting of priority crop and relatives. She also, uh, she also concluded that 71% of all these taxa are in urgent need of collection and conservation in gene bank and this is really alarming. Then Holly produced a map uh, using Maxan, which is a, a software for conservation planning, where she plotted hotspots for in situ conservation of crop art relatives, of these priority crop art relatives. And if you make a close up to the fertile crescent, you do have a couple of, uh, of areas that should be uh, conserved um, in that should be conserved in order to keep uh, to to underpin fertile crescent of underpin food security half of the temperate priority crop wild relative species are found exclusively here so this is a really really important area um, to help us in the future to feed the world basically So our, my last example is a predictive characterization of crop wild relatives. It is a tool a method that optimizes the search for populations accessions with adaptive traits when characterization and evaluation data is lacking or incomplete. It is based on geographic location, ecogeographic data, and assumes a relationship between trait and the environment of the current site, which is usually very strong in crop wild relatives. And some work has been done uh, in an EU-funded uh, project, the PGRCQ project, where almost um, 19,000 records, European records from GBIF, were gathered 
uh, for vena, beta, uh, brassic and medicago and petalifolia in order to do this uh, predictive characterization. This is a very complex slide and I'm, I'm sure you cannot really see the, you know, the small letters but this basically shows you the differences between the traditional characterization and the predictive characterization and the different methods. So the tra traditional is where when you, you have to grow, you cultivate your wild relatives and search for specific traits um, that are interesting for crop improvement. And for you with the predictive ex uh, characterization, you don't need to do that. It's a matter of combining environmental profiles, ecotographic data, uh, characteristics of the crop wild relative um, in order to try to find those accessions and populations that are really important for crop improvement. Then you have to uh, do evaluation, you have to evaluate these uh, crop ad relatives, these accessions, in order to know that is uh, really um, a good population to use as, uh, for crop improvement. And here, in uh, any of these three methods uh, of predictive characterization, GBIF data is very, very useful and especially very high quality georeference data is crucial. Okay, let me just finalize with some recommendations. Uh, improved data structure of data. I think there is an excess of georeferencing fields and most of them are incomplete. Uh, for us, it would be easier if they will be all together instead of, of alphabetical order. Um, Locality could be split into several administrative levels. For our analysis, it would help. Um, and also, if you could explain how to use georeferencing quality fields such as uh, coordinate accuracy, it would, it would be uh, very useful. Of course, this is probably not uh, um, you to do, but the records that do not have coordinates would be, um, for in our analysis, it would be completely excluded. Uh, so if these co coordinates could be added, it would be wonderful. Uh, if you have low quality records, uh, it would be good not to have them there, uh, because for us it will be maybe more difficult to do it since we, we deal with such a large uh, data set. And uh, going back to the world uh, representation in GBIF, uh, Fertile Crescent, uh, I think some information is missing there. And I know it's uh, something that you are working at the moment. Uh, it would be very good to have a, very, uh, a better worldwide representation. And perhaps integrate uh, with other sources of data. Uh, so, more actively engineer data submitted to GBIF to be of better quality, uh, review, review how they use, uh, GBIF users use the data, and uh, not just the results of the, um, of, the, of the use of the data, but how they actually use the data, and perhaps provide tools to help users exploit the data. Okay, just to finalize. There is an increased awareness of the importance of crop wild relative conservation and use. They are threatened and neglected, and they are likely to become very important for food security in the face of climate change. In situ and ex situ conservation of these species is inadequate, but strategic approaches have been uh, developed and tested national, regionally, and globally. And GBIF mediated data is definitely a very good source. Uh, in this in these uh, approaches, but we do need high quality reference data um, to uh, to efficiently conserve and plan our conserve, uh, our resources like crop wild relatives. So some acknowledgements, um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very elegant talk and thank you for the very detailed um, suggestions. We have time for one quick question while we change speakers. Yes. Thank you. Patricia Cole from Conavio. I will try to be quick. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. I just was thinking if, if the best idea of an indicator for prioritize um, the collection should be where there are more species richness because it's not at the species level that we might have the variety of characters that we are looking for food security 
an uneven measure, like when they are very low species, it's because they are very adapted to very drastic climatic conditions sometimes. So you really don't need, you need those species that have been exposed to these uh, difficult habitats and might not be the most, um, that those that they have more taxa per se. And I found, I, I don't know if you are only talking about wild relatives or crops, because that you're referencing in crops is quite difficult because they usually do not refer to one individual. It usually referred to an area where the different um, peasants um, go through the, for the seeds and you have a, a mixture of seeds. So you cannot have a very precise reference. I don't know if you are talking about the crops or only the wild relatives. No, I'm talking about the wild relatives of crops. So, for example, avena, uh, oats, uh, wild relatives of oats. Um, you, you are right. Well, species richness doesn't mean they are very important areas for uh, where crop wild relatives have develop, developed interesting traits. But that's why then we have this uh, predictive characterization and uh, perhaps those very adapted uh, locations of these species will be targeted there. Um, uh, for example, in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, I, I did some work in, some work in Jordan uh, with crop wild relatives, and there are very uh, uh, various species that are adapted to drought in these areas, and this crop wild relatives might be very important to the future if for those areas to grow crops in areas where drought is a problem. Uh, the other question you were talking about? You were talking about wild relatives, not the crops. Yes, yeah, yeah. Wild relatives, always wild relatives. And yes, uh, if you are collecting uh, Sometimes you have a georeference point and you just go there and you know that there, there's, you know, it's just maybe the center of the population and it's widespread. And when you are collecting to conserve or to, uh, well, basically to conserve, you have to have a broad, uh, a strategic way of collecting those seeds to conservation. It's not just that specific point. Great. Thank you very much.